Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2023 LACNET Annual Neuroendocrine Tumor Patient Conference. I am Dr. Karina Maria Parici. I am a clinical professor in radiology at the Stanford University and the director of the Targeted Radionuclide Therapy Program and Theragnostics Clinic. And I have been invited today to talk about the latest in PRRT. And I am very excited and I thank you everybody for the invitation. And this is going to be our outline. And without any further ado, we are going to start with PRRT and what is PRRT? PRRT stands for Peptide Receptor Radionuclide Therapy. And what that means is that this is a treatment, it's a therapy that is going to use radiation to get rid of malignant cells. And that happens thanks to the radionuclide. And I will explain in a minute uh, what that radionuclide is. And uh, since we want to uh, bring this radionuclide inside the malignant cell, we need a taxi. The taxi is going to be the peptide. A peptide is a very small part of a protein. And once it brings it to the right address, uh, in this case, the malignant cells, there is going to be something in the surface of these cells that is going to grab it and put it inside the cell and lock it inside. That it doesn't leave the cell and it is able to get rid of it. And that is the receptor in the surface of these malignant cells. That's what these four words mean. So let's start word by word explaining what this is and how it works. And I will start with the radionuclide because at the end of the day, what is going to do the job, the treatment itself, is going to be the radiation of the radionuclide. So what's a radionuclide? For that, we have to go back to our days of high school when we had to memorize the periodic table of the elements. What are elements? The combination of elements makes every single thing that we know that exists, including us. And these elements can be in a stable state or unstable state. And although they are the same element itself, oxygen is oxygen and hydrogen is hydrogen, the state where they are is going to be very important for us. Because when they are in a unstable state, they tend to emit radiation. And in medicine, we can use that radiation to help patients, and in this case, to treat malignant cells. I tend to use this example with uh, uh, our medical students and residents. Our kids are our kids. If you have children, you know that we love them when they are in a angelical state, but we also love them when they are not in a angelical state. They sometimes have tantrums and they have to release this energy and then they go back to another angelical state. This release of energy is important for them. It has to be dissipated. We have to let it happen. That's when these radionuclides emit the radiation. We just have to make sure that we use it um, for a good end. And in this case, this is going to get rid of malignant cells. So what types of radiation these uh, radionuclides that are in a non-stable state uh, can dissipate so that they become stable again? There are three main types of radiation. It's called ionizing radiation that can be emitted. Alpha, beta, and gamma. And I am going to explain the three of them so that we can understand the differences. And I will start with gamma. Gamma radiation is not used for therapy, generally speaking. It is used for diagnostic purposes. And if you have had a PET scan, we have used this type of radiation to obtain the images of that scan. There is no mass involved. It would be the equivalent of this little girl going through the tantrum, kicking the air. It's not kicking any object, but nevertheless, she is releasing a lot of energy. And this energy in a form of waves is going to be traveling or penetrating for uh, centimeters, meters feet. So it has a significant penetration. 
but we don't use gammas for treatment. We can use betas and alphas for treatment. Betas are significantly used now clinically, FDA approved, in the clinic these days for treatment of usually neuroendocrine malignancies. Beta emissions or beta radiations involve mass. It would be the equivalent of this girl going through this tantrum kicking a heavy cannonball. The mass of beta emissions is actually the mass of an electron. As you can imagine, this girl can kick the ball. It's a heavy ball. It can travel a little bit, maybe millimeters, and it is going to affect every single thing that is in the trajectory of this big, heavy cannonball. And wherever it sits is going to deposit a lot of energy, energy that is going to convince a malignant cell to go to sleep forever and commit suicide because it's going to affect the DNA of this cell. This is a beta emission used for treatments like lutetium-177. That's a radionuclide that is a beta emitter. And what about alpha emitters? With alpha emitters, we bring the big guns to the therapeutic area. This would be the equivalent of this little girl going through this tantrum, kicking a huge piece of furniture that is extremely heavy and bulky. As you can imagine, if she kicks that piece of furniture, it's barely going to move. So therefore, the penetration of this radiation is tiny, it's less than a millimeter, it's measured in microns. But if this piece of furniture receives enough energy, to fall and it falls on top of something is going to crush it and smash it because there is a lot of mass that is going to affect that space where it ends up being released, uh, the energy of that radiation. So therefore we will use alphas and betas energies to be able to kill these malignant cells that will be inside the malignant cells since we are going to use a peptide and the R receptor to be able to introduce it inside the malignant cell. Once inside the malignant cell, the goal is that it's going to affect the nucleus of this cell, the control room, what basically organizes everything in the cell. It's going to affect it, it's going to affect the DNA, Beta emissions usually have single strand damage. Alpha emissions, since they are heavier and more powerful, they tend to have double strand damage. The idea is that the cell is going to have to repair all this damage. It's going to use the energy of the cell instead of to multiplicate and to replicate, to repair again and again. Eventually, the goal is for this nucleus to become so unstable and tired of being repaired that it's going to decide that the cell should commit suicide. And that's what we call apoptosis. That's our favorite way of getting rid of malignant cells because there is no inflammatory uh, changes associated with it. Although sometimes, especially when there is a high energy like alphas, we may destroy the cell and then we get rid of the cell faster towards necrosis, and then we can see some few inflammatory changes. But again, our goal is to be able to get rid of malignant cells through the suicide mechanism, what we call apoptosis. And this happens for every single emission of radiation. But if you hear me saying that there are billions with a B, billions of these rays emitted from a radionuclide every second, you will see that this is a lot of damage for the cell. And if you hear me saying that there are billions of radiations emitted in a second, not only for minutes or hours or days or weeks, this goes on for months. So uh, as you can imagine, there is a lot of damage done to these cells so that we convince them to disappear from the body of the patient. And that is our goal. So hopefully now you will understand the difference between alphas and betas. Alphas have a lot of power. We put them inside the cells, the penetration so that it can affect cells around this targeted cell 
is based in microns, so it's going to affect a layer or two layers of cells. Therefore, there is not going to be much crossfire between cells that we call, but the convincing power of uh, getting rid of that malignant cell is much higher. The beta radiation has higher penetration. It travels more. It's going to affect more cells. There is going to be more crossfire, but the power of convincing is not as high as the alpha. So there are pros and cons for both types of radiation, both of them having a therapeutic effect. So knowing all this, now you will understand every single thing I say about the only FDA-approved PRRT agent in the market nowadays. The commercial name is Lutathera, and it is provided in four cycles, two months apart. And now you will understand that by the time we provide another cycle two months later, there is still some residual effect from the first cycle that was done two months earlier. You will understand now probably if I tell you that the radionuclide that is used is lutetium-177 and it is a beta emitter. Now you know which type of radiation we are discussing here. And what we will do with Lutathera is we will introduce it inside the vein of the patient. As you saw, this is a little vial. We'll only have to introduce one, two, or three cc's. Once inside the body of the patient in the bloodstream is going to be looking at all the cells in the body is this taxi, the peptide, which is going to be a somatostatin analog, is going to be looking for somatostatin receptors. It likes to go home. It likes to go to the somatostatin receptors. They are very overexpressed in these malignant neuroendocrine tumors. It's going to attach to the somatostatin receptor. It's going to be internalized in the malignant cell. It's going to be locked inside the cell. And then it's going to start emitting all this radiation that is going to affect this cell and few layers of cells um, around it. In this particular case of lutathera, the penetration in tissue is usually about 0.67 millimeters with a maximum tissue penetration of 2.2. And then lutetium-177 will decay and it will become a stable isotope again. So hopefully now you have a better understanding of alphas, betas, the FDA-approved beta PRT that is in the market. There are many places in the United States that provides PRRT with lutathera these days. I obtained this map from the manufacturer of Lutathera from the company. So as you can see, there are plenty of places. We are one of them and we are more than happy to help you and your loved ones. Um, Lutathera is a very good option for our patients with neuroendocrine tumors. It provides a very good quality of life while the patients are going through the treatments because we like to treat the cells through this suicidal mechanism and therefore try to avoid inflammatory changes. It has a very good safety profile. There are very few significant side effects. It provides a good symptom control of the carcinoid syndrome and has a very high progression-free survival. And regarding the outcome of the survival, that is still to be confirmed, but it definitely increases the progression-free survival and the control of the symptoms. So that is FDA approved. I wanted to provide some updates about the non-FDA approved PRRTs that are happening in clinical trials. So an update on COMPIT stopped enrolling. COMPIT is a clinical trial that compares a PRRT different to Lutathera, but is also lutetium-177 with a peptide, which is a Dota top, also an analog of somatostatin receptors. It is compared to Everolimus, and stay tuned because we can't wait to know more about the results of this clinical trial. Netter 2 and Compose, they are still open to clinical trials, in this case for uh, high-grade G2 and G3 nets. Compete was for G1 and G2, and they are still enrolling. So if you think that you could benefit from these clinical trials, please reach out 
to institutions that have them open. There are also clinical trials related to somatostatin antagonists instead of agonists. The agonists tend to go to the somatostatin receptor and bring the complex inside the cell and lock the radionuclide inside the cell. Antagonists tend to keep them usually in the surface, but there is the possibility that there is higher attachment to receptors and therefore there are these studies that are trying to prove that for those tumors that do not have a very high overexpression expression of somatostatin receptors, it could be beneficial. So if that were to be the case uh, of your situation, feel free to look for clinical trials that are studying antagonists of the somatostatin receptors. And of course, the other type of radioisotopes that are alpha emitter. So I have news from Racy Bio and from Alpha Medic. Both of them have clinical trials with alpha emitters. Racy Bio has the clinical trial named Action One. It is using actinium-225 as an alpha emitter. This is the element that is unstable and it is emitting alpha rays. They just completed phase 1b of the clinical trial action one, enrolling phase 3 patients. So keep an eye on this clinical trial and the other clinical trial that has also very recent news, actually from May 16, is Alpha Medics. They just announced that they completed the phase two of their clinical trial, Radiomedics and Arnold Med, and therefore we have to keep an eye on phase three. In this case, these companies are using LED 212, also an alpha emitter. So these are news from the uh, clinical trials for, uh, for alpha. By the way, they are also called ATA. And I am also providing some uh, places where treatments with alpha emission can be uh, received in the planet. Uh, so I'm, provide, I'm providing three places, two from Germany and one from India, where you could feel free to reach out if you think that you are probably not a good candidate for these clinical trials, but you still would like to receive information about the possibility of these therapies. And with that, I hope that you found this of your interest. We went from basics to the latest news. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, let you know that we are here to help. Thank you very much.